Did you ever wonder where roses come from? Well, I know you know they come from a bush. But how was this bush created? Who created this rose? Those are rose breeders, or hybridizers is the other word that you'll hear a lot. They take pollen from one flower, put it on another flower to hopefully create a new rose that's maybe more fragrant, more disease resistant, different shape, different color, all these different characteristics. Now, a lot of you have asked me, how do you hybridize roses? I don't know how to do it because I've never done it myself. So what I've done is gone out and got a very talented hybridizer by the name of Brad Jalbert from Select Roses in Vancouver, Canada, and he's going to teach you how to hybridize roses. But before we get started, let's meet Brad. And here's Brad. So let me introduce you. This is Brad Jalbert, very good friend of mine, very talented rose breeder. So say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. Good. Now, Brad... We're standing here in your your greenhouse, yes. your seedling greenhouse. Yes. Why don't you explain to everybody what we're looking at? Well, right in front of us, we have first-year test seedlings that are starting their trial. To the left, we have the mother plants. So we have our mothers, fathers, where we're doing all of our crossing. So what is a mother and a father? The, the mother sets the seed, the father is the pollen parent, and that's what we have to start looking for. Okay, so that's where it all begins. That's where it all begins. Okay, and maybe tell a little bit about why you choose a certain mother or a certain father. The, the, the mother plant we're looking at in the same way as the father plant. We want healthy plant, we want pretty foliage. Generally speaking, we're finding that the mother offers the health of the plant. Often the father, we find, brings in a much different flower. So we're trying to combine the two to come up with okay. something that's better than what we started with. So you're trying to basically get one plus one equals three. Absolutely. Okay. So we will start with beginning with selecting the mother plant and the and father the plant. plant. Yes. And that's where we'll go right now. Okay, so now we've selected both the mother and the father rose. The mother we selected because it's very fragrant, pretty flower, and the father we selected because we want to increase the disease resistance of this rose. These are the three flowers that we're going to be emasculating the pollen from. And next we'll show you how we take the pollen off the flower. Okay, we've selected our father here. Really critical when you're collecting a pollen is the stage that the pollen is at. This flower that we have to the left here is a little bit too tight. So if we try to force this open to get the pollen, we'll end up knocking most of the pollen off and the pollen also won't release properly. This flower is fully open and you can see the pollen is begin to dry up in there. So if we were to pull this off, we wouldn't get any viable pollen for the female. This one is at the correct stage. The bloom is about halfway open. We can force this open a little bit more so we can get the pollen out of the plant. So we'll just strip these few petals off here. There we go. And that is the pollen off the plant right there. We're going to put it into our cup down below. And usually what I do is I strip several flowers at a time so that we have enough pollen in our cup. So I'm going to do this we wait, you can see the pollen is now down in here. That will take about a day, and we'll shake the cup around, and after sitting about a day, you'll see a little bit of the dust, the pollen on the bottom of the cup. So with hybridizing a rose, timing is everything. Here we are one day later, the pollen is beginning to shed in the cup so that it's viable, and now we need to prepare the mother plant so that we can apply the pollen. First thing we'll need to do is make sure the flower is at the stage of prep, which is about halfway open. So I'll bring you in closer now and show you how we'll prepare the mother. So we have the mother ready to emasculate, and we do that by stripping off all the outer and inner petals. And the only thing that we're leaving now is going to be basically the female part of the plant. So we strip the petals off like this, and you'll see there's the pollen on there that we collected from the previous flower, but in this case we don't want this flower to pollinate itself, so we need to strip all of the pollen off. After we've done that, we'll wait about another eight hours until the mother is ready to be pollinated. So we've waited about another eight hours. The mother is now going to be more receptive to the pollen. We put a little bit of the pollen on the end of our finger and just brush it over the top of the plant just like that. 
Usually I'll do this two times. Once after about an eight hour period, then I'll wait one more day and I'll brush more pollen on the plant again. So here we are 24 hours later. Labeling is really important. Some breeders will go through and pollinate many different flowers with different pollen. If you have a smaller breeding program, it's often easier to make one mother with one father and we use one label so that we know that this plant has all been pollinated with the same rows. After 24 hours, we like to go back again and pollinate the flower. So this will be its final pollination and we'll do the same thing that we did yesterday. So after we've made our cross, we wait a few months for the hip to form. This is the hip forming on the plant here. Typically the time to harvest it is when the hip starts to turn orange. That would be in the fall. We're not at the fall yet, but we want to show you how to take the seeds out. So we will harvest this hip and then we'll process the seeds. Okay, so we've harvested our hip. Typically, again, we'll be waiting till this hip turns bright orange, which would be the fall. But for the purpose of the video, we're taking it a little bit early. We cut off the tail of the hip. We flip it over, cut off the front portion of it, and the seeds that we're going after are inside. So we're going to cut this hip right in half, and we'll look inside. We can see the seeds are white. If, the, if we had done this in the fall, those seeds would have already started to pick up a little bit of brownish or even an orangish coloring inside there. We use our knife again like this, and then we pop the seeds out just like this, right onto the table. Uh, the average hip, depending on the rows, will supply you with anywhere from three seeds, maybe to 30 or 40 seeds. Usually I find the average one is around a dozen seeds or more. Okay, we have our seed ready for planting here. Remember, rose seeds have to be stratified. That is, they have to think they've gone through a winter. If you live in a mild climate, you'll harvest your seeds in the fall, wrap them in damp paper towel, put them in a plastic bag, and in the bottom of your refrigerator for about six weeks. After that, you'll be planting them. In my climate, we don't heat the greenhouses, so we can take these seeds in the fall, sprinkle them in our soil right away, and we don't worry about using sterilized soil because we want any of the hybrids that germinate to be tough from day one. So we will sprinkle them in the soil, we'll add another quarter inch of soil on top of them, and we'll put them in a cold greenhouse that doesn't freeze solid, but it still has fluctuating typical winter temperatures, which would be similar to being in a fridge. After anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks, they'll begin to germinate. Welcome to the seedling field. This is one of the seedlings we selected from the greenhouse we were working in. This happens to be a yellow floribunda. The reason I kept this one over other yellow ones is that it had a distinctly blue colored foliage. We're looking for something that's a little bit different. So as far as planting them out in the field goes, a couple things to think about. We have a heavy amount of trees around this area, so the seedlings all have limited sunlight. The soil is heavy clay, it's waterlogged in the winter. We have some weed here, we do apply some weed control. We fertilize them one time a year, we water them only in the drought, and we do no spraying with fungicide or insecticides. We want a hard trial. We expect some of the seedlings are going to die off. We expect we're going to see some disease. The whole idea is I want the seedling to look its worst in my field so that when it goes to the home gardener under normal care, it turns into a better rose, better looking plant. They'll spend at least two to three years growing in this type of care conditions before we then move to the next step, which is sending them on to other people testing them. We're here relaxing at the end of a nice day of work with Brad. Brad, thank you so much, first of all, for letting us come in and, and see what your program is you're, all about. You're welcome, anytime. And I think something else that the people would really love to see and understand from you is just how long this process takes. So maybe you could just say, you know, how many crosses do you make, how many seedlings, okay. how many get to the field, etc. Sure. sure. It, it starts with the initial cross. We may do 500 to 1,000 crosses a year. Wow. Out, out of the 500 to 1,000, we'll collect around 10,000 seeds. We'll plant those, maybe we get half of them to germinate, that gives us 5,000. Out of those 5,000, we select the first year down to about 200. Wow. 
From that 200, we then select the next year, maybe 100 of them to go into the testing field. That's incredible. So you've gone from basically about 5,000 seedlings down to 100 plants in the test field. And then at and that point, how many roses do you think you could possibly introduce to market? And how long does that take? We're thrilled if we spend three years with them in the field. And out of those three years, we come up with maybe three to four of them that we can send for further testing and hopefully a couple of those will actually make it to the market. That's amazing. So it's not like it's it's not like just turning on a spigot and roses start pouring uh, out. That would be wonderful. Yeah, that, that would be nice. Like that. <laughs> and everybody no, could do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. It just takes a long time to get to market. And that's something to think about next time you look at a rose. And Brad, one other question that I get all the time yeah. from people is how does a rose get its name? Uh, the, a few different things happen. Uh, one thing, we're looking for a product that's going to be commercial, people are going to like to buy. So yeah. often we'll just name it a pretty name, Fra Fragrant Gold Yellow or something like that. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, the other thing that we specifically do will be offer some of our seedlings for custom rose naming. So if somebody wants to name a rose for their mother, there is a, a certain price involved in that. Oh, that's and nice. they can name one of our roses and have their own family rose. Oh, that's nice. So they can pick the rose out and then you, yeah. it'll be they, a custom naming. We'll, and, we'll offer yeah. a, a a certain amount of seedlings, we'll work with them depending on the color they're looking for and uh, the budget that's in involved. And then that rose is registered with the name that they chose. That's great. That's a really nice way to commemorate someone to remember something, isn't it? People that have done it yeah. love it. It's, it's the gift that continues over, over the years. That's great. What I hope you've gotten from this video, as much as anything else, is that people like Brad are the heroes of the rose world. The late Jack Harkness wrote a beautiful book called The Makers of Heavenly Roses, and that's exactly who these people are. So next time you see a rose, smell a rose, rose, I want you to remember the people who are working so hard to bring these roses to us. So, Brad, thank you very much. Anytime. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Pleasure. Thank you.